the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Help us to see God not in the skies or the mountaintops, but in the trenches, in the valleys where no one expects God to be. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. Well, thank you. Merry Christmas Eve, rather. Um, I hope you all had a very good Merry Christmas Eve Eve. If you get that reference, I like you. And I want to say it's so good to see all of you. This is, this is great to see so many faces in the sanctuary. I do want to say that Christmas has become a little secularized, if I do have to say so myself. Santa is more popular than Jesus, I think, now. Um, and I think it's easy to forget how important the Christmas message actually is. In today's world, and especially politics, we look for that one person who can lead us and make us better. They promise to fix us, and we promise to say, okay, let's see how you do. We often put this burden on, who do you think? The president. Oh, man, we love to put the president on this pedestal and say, fix us, please, sir, and hopefully one day, ma'am. We want a candidate who has all the answers, who can fix all the problems, who knows how to speak to foreign countries, who won't tax us, who won't send us to war, who will make uh, the economy the best it's ever been. And they have to do all of this in four years. If they're lucky, eight. This is a tall order that we put on one person and is absolutely unobtainable. All of those presidents that we've ever had were all human. And they have all failed miserably at making everyone happy. I think we can all think of a president that we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> we are looking for a Messiah in the wrong place. We have forgotten that we already have one. And he came in the form of a baby through a poor family. 
I don't know if you know this, but most presidents are rich before they get to office and after they get off to, from office. And when this baby grew up, he didn't conquer. He didn't become Caesar. He didn't make promises to cure all of the people of all of their problems here on earth. Instead, he spoke out against injustice, advocated for love above all else, proclaimed forgiveness of sins, and lived a life devoted to helping those who were poor and marginalized know that they had worth in God's eyes. I don't know how many of you know much about Roman society, but it was a classist society. There were levels of humans. And certain people had rights and certain people didn't. So when Jesus came along and said, hey, wait, all of you have rights, that wasn't very well received. The most important thing Jesus did was obviously save our souls. We get to go to heaven and be with God. But the second most important thing that he did was to show us that every human life has worth. Every single one. That together we can make a world worth living in and to stop our reliance on so-called human leaders to save us. And to see that the way to change the world is from the bottom up, not the top down. The way to change the world is from the bottom up, not the top down. Jesus died because he threatened the power of those on top. He made the people see that humans are humans no matter the position that they hold, and that God is the only true authority. And if we were to accept that, accept God as our true authority, our true leader, we would show it by living a life filled with love, with mercy, with forgiveness, and care for the marginalized and poor. God came into this world through the bottom, not through the top. When searching for our leaders, because we need leaders, otherwise it'd be chaos, it can be tempting to look for strength and authoritarianism. It can be tempting to believe the false promises of, I can fix all your problems. But Jesus shows us that a God-centered leader is neither of those things, doesn't make false promises, and recognizes that they can't fix everything. But rather, the promise that they can make, that a leader can make, and that we should want is one who is gentle, one who is kind, one who knows how to forgive, one who is relentlessly merciful, especially when it's undeserved. Because when we proclaim Christ as king, that is who we see as our king, gentle, kind, forgiving, and relentlessly merciful. So may this Christ Mass, that's where we get Christmas, the Christ Mass, remind us that God does not lead by strength and power, but through humility and love, and by empowering those at the bottom to change those at the top. If we can agree to love one another no matter what, we can truly start to live into that kingdom that Jesus so often talked about. So let us live into what Jesus sees us as, his beloved siblings and fellow children of God, invited into the eternal banquet through the birth of a fragile, poor, often marginalized, he came from Nazareth, baby boy. Amen. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen.
Jesus, Lord, have your 